This is Simon with Weedenverse, and I'm here with the lovely Emily Silver, writer extraordinaire, <laughs> who apparently, I'm to understand, is a huge <laughs> Buffy fan. Caught yes, up with my her. Shirt. Yes. <laughs> caught up with her in the Bones panel, and she, which she's a writer on, and she has a new project that she's going to talk about. Yeah, it's called Finding Carter. It started on MTV three weeks ago. Um, we've aired four episodes, and Alexis Denisoff plays the father, plays David, and um, that, that was kind of like the most special moment for me when I found out we were getting Alexis Denisoff, and I was like, wait a minute, he likes it? He's done everything we did. Maybe that means my writing is not so bad. So I was hopeful. <laughs> so how did Alexis get a, a hold of it? Um, I don't know. I, I think his representatives gave it, gave it to him, and he wasn't sure if he should read it because it's pretty much every parent's worst nightmare. You know, like your kid gets kidnapped, and what do you do with those years while they're gone? And, and pray they come back and that they're not dead. And I think you know, as he's a relatively new father, I imagine it was it's a scary thing for him. But I can't imagine anybody more capable of hand, handling it. He's so good, and he's just perfect <laughs> for it. Well, well, uh, let's talk a bit about the show. So what is the concept behind it? So Carter is a 16-year-old girl who um, went to a high school party and got arrested. And all of her friends got picked up by their parents except for her. And it turns out, she finds out from the police, she's this girl who was abducted when she was three years old. And she's been missing this whole time. And the woman she thought was her mother is actually her kidnapper. And she loves this woman and they've been living together in happiness and whatever all this time. And now this woman gone on the run and she's Carter's forced to go back and live with her biological family and it's about Carter finding herself and really the family finding herself in light of um, in light of the fact that they defined themselves for all these years on this missing daughter and now she's back how do they redefine themselves and um, and she knows herself so well she was brought up by a mother that she would cared for so much um, does she need to redefine who she is or is, or can she believe enough in herself to sort of keep that and go forward with it? So, what was the origin of this? Where, because this is really, it's a, <laughs> I mean, that's a very uh, difficult subject to tackle. Where did that come from? Uh, well, um, I, I like to think it was my combination of my love for everything Whedon and my young obsession with BC Andrews and really, really messed up stories um, and really messed up family stories. But uh, I think I was doing research for a different project and I got onto the subject of adoption and um, this idea that there was, you know, there's a, pu a pusher and sort of like a puller in, in most adoption situations, one parent who's very eager to do it. So I started reading about, um, you know, what that feeling is like, about this feeling of not being able to connect to a child, this, the fear of that. And um, it sort of morphed into, well, what if it was your child, but she had been kidnapped and so you don't know who she is and you are strangers but yet you're meant to be together what's that like did you come across any cases that parallel this story unfortunately most kidnapping cases don't end well there are a couple um but generally speaking i think people don't end up people who are kidnapped aren't in particularly good situations and i thought that um what was really unusual about carter's situation was that you know she, this woman that she loved had done something so terrible, so heinous that it blows her mind, but she can't stop loving her. And how do you how do you deal with that when you, she's done something so hateable, <laughs> not a word, but hateable, and you still want her in your life? And I feel like a lot of people deal with that, problems they have like that, where you hate somebody's actions, you still love them, and where do you find the common ground? So. Yeah. <laughs> Now, how did you get involved in writing? Was this some, what was the process to get from being a V.C. Andrews reader to being someone who now has a show on MTV? Well, um, I guess I started, I loved Buffy, it came on when I was like 13, and I was like, I'm so obsessed with the show, Sarah Michelle Gellar is the greatest thing ever, I have to be a brown belt in Taekwondo just like her. And um, I went through all that and I got my brown belt in Taekwondo, and then I realized, you know, Sarah's great, amazing. I think she's one of the best out there. But uh, it was really Joss that I loved. And it was really the words, you know, that were so wonderful. And I started figuring that out around when I was like 16, 17. And when I went to college, a friend convinced me to do a screenwriting class. I was petrified, but I did it. And I was like, this is serious endorphins. Like, 
that was for real me getting high on life, high on writing, and it was great, and I was like, I want to do this. So I moved out here after I graduated, and I started PAing, and I literally worked from the bottom up, but I have amazing mentors like Mark Guggenheim and Greg Berlanti and Sherry Cooper and Jennifer Levin, and they literally have taught me everything that I know, and I would not be here without four of them. Now, how long have you been on Bones? This is my second season on the show. I'm right now supposed to be off writing my scripts. Hi, Bones writers. I'm sort of writing. Um, so I'm writing my third episode right now. It's about human trafficking. Um, what I really like about Bones is that you get the opportunity to explore social issues. And, um, you know, I, I think that you can do it without passing judgment. You can take all these varying sides of it. And that's what's great about having a character like Brennan and Booth who are complete, like, opposites. By the way, working with David Boreanaz has been crazy embarrassing and awesome. <laughs> and can you tell us why that might be? I think when he found out I was a fan, you know, his parents were on set one day and they were so nice and I was talking to them and it just came up that I was a fan. Somehow it came up. Um, and they told him and then I haven't stopped blushing ever since because it's super embarrassing, but he's really cool about it and just a tremendous actor and such a presence. So it's was sur surreal to work on a show with him and then to create a show with another character from the lead inverse was I don't know what's more surreal than surreal but yeah Me meta surreal <laughs> meta surreal yes <laughs> so, well, it's gonna be my new word you're welcome to it <laughs> Thanks. so what is the future now on this project and then do you have some other things that you're cooking well with any luck and you know knock on wood Finding Carter will go a while. The woman who is co uh, currently show running it, Terry Minsky, is fantastic. She's um, she really gets the whole strong female character thing, and I couldn't be happier that she's the one who's helming it. Especially since I'm on Bones full time. I mean, I still got the opportunity to go in and write a script um, for Finding Carter mid season, um, but she's the best. And so hopefully there will be a lot of longevity there, and that can keep going. And maybe I can pop in and stay there for a while. Um, I don't know, it's like you never want to leave a family that's working really well, and Bones is a fantastic writing family. Um, and, and Stephen Nathan is a great person to learn from. Um, yeah, because apparently he was on Laverne and Shirley, which, also a big fan, that was pretty cool for me. Um, but I don't know, next from here, hopefully I'll be developing some more projects, maybe one day getting another show in the air. Maybe. <laughs> well, let's talk about your writing heroes. You'd mentioned that a lot of them came out of your interest in Buffy. Who are the oh, folks yeah. that, that really you find inspirational? Well, I'd like to one day be the female Joss Whedon. Um, but that, seeing as how I think, already? seeing as how I think that's Jane Espenson, uh. I really just want to be her. Um, she's the best, I think. I, I would like to model myself as much after her as possible. I think that she does things. She takes tropes and she turns them on their heads, and, and it's so smart. Um, and that's really just one I want to learn how to do and focus on, I guess, subverting your expectations. Um, and Marty Knoxon. Marty Knoxon, actually, the reason why I got my first job on a show called Brothers and Sisters is because Marty Knoxon was running it. And I was like, I love Marty Knoxon and I want more than anything to be on a show with her. And I went nonverbal. I couldn't speak in front of her. It was thoroughly embarrassing. Which is pretty much sums up everybody that I meet in the weed inverse. So. That's but, great. Yeah. That's, uh, well, I have to. Everyone keeps telling me I have to learn to like talk to weed inverse people, like their um, coworkers or like compatriots, as opposed to me being cra crazy fangirl. But I'm not sure I'll ever get there. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. But there are just some. I mean, really, Drew Greenberg, like all these people who came out of the, uh, who's now on Arrow, all these people who came out of the Buffy writers' room. That I mean, I can't imagine being a fly on the wall in that room. That would be incredible. Thank <laughs> you.